recording purposes. Uh, it, it's an absolute honor to be named Aviator of the Year. I'm, I'm humbled by the experience uh, for all the recognition. I was simply happy to have been in the right place at the right time to, to help a fellow aviator in his time of need. And uh, so I was really just, just happy with the way the mission turned out. And now to be honored is certainly icing on the cake and, and a, a bit overwhelming, honestly. Uh, absolutely not. No, it's 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 something that we all, uh, I suppose, hope for and, and wish for. But uh, with with so many other outstanding aviators that make up uh, the Marine Corps uh, aviation side of the house, is really not something that you really think is ever going to happen to you. Uh, we just go out and try to do our best every time, and uh, and that's just uh, the most that I can hope for. Well, I, I got a uh, phone call from a very good friend of mine who had seen uh, the official message came out from Headquarters Marine Corps, and he had seen it uh, uh, before me, and I got a phone call from him, and uh, just, you know, he was exuberant and uh, excited and, and congratulatory, and uh, so I was shocked, um, something I didn't expect, and uh, so uh, very, very exciting, and uh, just, again, humbled and, and overwhelmed. Well, it was a it was night three of Operation Odyssey Dawn, and uh, we had been preparing for uh, armed reconnaissance mission, which is where we would uh, go out searching for uh, the targets, the uh, targets that the Qaddafi regime had been using, and then uh, look to strike uh, with bombs on those targets. Uh, so we had completed briefing for that mission, and uh, it was middle of the night, and uh, we were doing night operations, so it was, it was time to get lunch at uh, 2300 or 11 o'clock at night. And so we made our way to the wardroom and uh, <clears throat> started to get a bite to eat, and from that point, rumors started to filter into the wardroom amongst the other officers uh, there, uh, rumor of an F-15 crashing uh, in uh, the vicinity of uh, Benghazi, and that uh, the command was uh, contemplating la launching the, uh, the trap or tactical recovery of air crew and personnel package in order to rescue uh, the downed pilot. So at that point, uh, we all made our way down to the operations center, uh, where the, the hub of the, the operations there on the ship, uh, to find out as much information as we could. Um, at that time, uh, we found out uh, what it, their mission was, which was to go out and uh, be uh, striking some of the, the surface-to-air missile systems in the area. So naturally, uh, we assumed the worst case that that was what had caused uh, the crash of the F-15 and was some sort of surface air fire. And now we you know, later found out that wasn't the case, but at the time that's what we were expecting and sort of planning for. So armed with that information uh, and uh, that the pilot uh, had been uh, located and authenticated on the radio uh, and uh, they were talking to him, uh, they had found out that he had been evading for about uh, four kilometers or so for about an hour uh, trying to get away from up to five to six vehicles that were pursuing him uh, through the desert there. Uh, and uh, you know, he could hear gunfire, dogs barking, that type of thing. Uh, so with that information, his last known position, uh, the MU commander uh, made the decision to launch the trap mission. Uh, he gave uh, the signal to me and my wingman to go ahead and walk to the aircraft and launch from the ship. Uh, it was my wingman's uh, first night of combat operations and I told him as we were making our way, hey, grab your pistol and grab two extra magazines of uh, ammunition and I, his eyes got uh, the size of a dinner plate uh, and he said, Where, what am I supposed to do uh, with that extra ammunition? I said, hey, just put it in your G-suit pocket. We don't know what's going to happen out there. Uh, so from there, we made our way to the aircraft and launched from the ship, uh, which was about 150 miles or so from the coastline of Libya. Uh, once I was airborne, I uh, got information from the uh, command center that uh, weapon release to protect the downed pilot was authorized and really that's all I needed to know uh, as I'm proceeding to, to the target area of what I can do, what I'm uh, authorized to do with the bombs that I was carrying that night. Uh, What 
Well, at, at that time, um, you sort of have to put all that aside and just realize uh, that all bets are off when one of our own goes down. We're going to take every opportunity uh, to get in there and, and to get him out. That goes for me and my women and our Harriers, the Osprey pilots and the Marine recon uh, personnel that were in the, in the back of those planes, uh, the other people that were in the uh, CH-53s. All of us had to consider that, and, and none of us questioned for a, a moment uh, that we had to get in there and that we were going to take every opportunity uh, and every chance that we could to get in and to, to, to rescue him. And honestly, what's going through my mind is uh, I was recalling some stories I've read about the Vietnam War of when, when pilots would go down uh, in North Vietnam, how uh, every aircraft airborne uh, would stop everything they were doing and, and go to where that pilot was and, and make every effort to get him out. So I, I, those, those sort of stories and images were in my mind as I'm making my way and going, okay, this is my opportunity to make a difference, uh, to, to sort of live up to the large shoes that, uh, that they had uh, of you know, all the heroic things they did. And um, as many good stories as there were from that era, there were also bad ones. And I didn't want that to happen to this, to this uh, F-15 pilot. I wanted to make every, uh, take every chance I could to, to make sure it had a happy ending uh, for him. And then, so, then I guess it's after the story, so you, you're taking off, you're heading to, to help him. Yes, and uh, so uh, after I received the information that uh, weapon release is authorized, I, I switch over to his radio frequency that he's operating on from his handheld radio, and I begin just to listen to, to gain situational awareness of what's going on on the ground. And uh, the first thing I hear is the wind rustling uh, past the microphone on his his radio and I hear him whispering uh, to an F-16 pilot that's overhead his position who's helping direct him to a uh, hide location in a creek bed near where he was and this is the first time that it all became real to me uh, hearing him on the ground that this is no longer training this is no longer the fields of North Carolina this is uh, a, a fellow service member who's fearing for his life uh, there on the ground and, and this is a real mission um, so at that point, the F-16 has to depart the area to get more fuel, and I take over as on-scene commander of the area, and I begin to talk to the pilot. Um, my first conversation with him is he begins describing those same vehicles, uh, now getting closer to his position with searchlights on, um, and I'm able to quickly, uh, it, was, it was ideal conditions that night, uh, not a cloud in the sky, a bright full moon, and wearing night vision goggles, so looking out of the target area, I could quickly uh, see the vehicle that he was talking about, the searchlight on, meandering through the desert, getting closer to his location. Uh, at that point, I tell him what ordinance I have on board, which is two 500-pound bombs, and I ask, do you need these bombs uh, against these pursuing vehicles? And he says, yes, yes, I do. Uh, so within five minutes of being overhead, I proceed out to a position to where I can release the ordinance. And in a, in a very real moment, he comes up on the radio before I'm releasing, and, and while you know, with obvious emotion and, and crying, he, he says, hey, tell my wife I love her. And, and again, the, the stories of what I've read of uh, historic events, and I thought that I'm not going to let anything happen to this guy. So I tell him, um, don't worry, I'm going to have a bomb on the deck in one minute. So from that point, uh, I get to a position to where I can release release the bomb and uh, host it for about 50 seconds uh, all the way to a direct impact on the vehicle with the, the with the searchlight. At that, I was about 2,000 meters from his position. So you seeing that, I mean, that, that's too close. Absolutely. Um, it was, now I, I had had received some special training that allowed me to to take into account his position, uh, the effects of my fires or the effects of my bombs, a geometry of to where I needed to be in order to, to not uh, affect the friendly's location, his position. And um, so I could consider all that as I am determining which direction to come in to release the bomb. And uh, absolutely too close for comfort. And, and again, just underlining the fact that, you know, I had to, I had to, to, to make a difference uh, in, into getting these vehicles to stop, uh, cease and desist with their pursuing. And so what happens after you release the bomb? 
Uh, well, through its time of flight, uh, I'm just keeping my sensor on it, uh, laser uh, via laser uh, guidance, uh, all the way to the direct impact. And when uh, once the bomb impacts, I, I notice another vehicle that I hadn't seen before. And so I, I notify him, hey, I see this other, other vehicle. Do you, do you need the other bomb? He says, yes, yes, I do. Uh, so I maneuver out to another position uh, to release the second bomb. Uh, successfully uh, get good guidance on that weapon. And uh, at the impact of that one, the pursuers finally get the, uh, the message that I was trying to send and they immediately vacate the area and uh, cease their persistence in, in trying to, uh, to get to the, to the downed pilot. Uh, so at that point, I'm now able to, to give sole attention to looking for a suitable landing zone for the Osprey aircraft, which had just launched uh, from the ship just after I did. And, uh, uh, you know, the hardest part of the, a trap uh, mission is locating the friendly and, and ensuring that once the rescue vehicle, in this case the MV-22, gets to his position is in there, in the target area for his short amount of period uh, as possible and in this case they were able to land within 50 meters of his position and uh, he was in the back of the aircraft before they really even knew he was there and, and had a chance to react so it was really a, a spectacular uh, event in that they were only in there for a few moments uh, and then on their way back to the ship uh, shortly thereafter and, and led to a very uh, very happy ending there at the ship where we were able to shake hands with the pilot and welcome him aboard and and uh, look him in in the eye and, and you know just share a moment of joy of, of how the admission turned out. And what was it? I mean, what was it like that, that moment where, where you see him back safely on the ship? Uh, very emotional um, because realizing how close he came to potentially a very bad situation. Um, we shook hands, said thanks uh, to each other, um, and, and that was really about it. He was, he was at that time being looked at by the doctors, making sure he didn't sustain any uh, life-threatening injuries from his ejection. So it was a brief uh, moment of, of talking to one another, uh, but certainly emotional and uh, very, very satisfying. And, uh, gratifying that we were, you know, able to have such a successful end to the mission. And so that was something when he was, when he was back on the ground and the cars were getting closer, that was something that he and you kind of decided together as two cars we have to, we have to make sure that we get this done. Uh, yeah, that was something that we decided together. Yes, absolutely. Uh, he, as the, as the man on the deck there, m more acutely aware of what's going on uh, with, with the pursuing vehicles at this time had been, uh, upwards of an hour that he'd been trying to get away from them and they had not uh, stopped their pursuit. And so knowing what I had uh, for weapons on my aircraft, the qualification that I had, uh, so we had a conversation about it and he asked for it and I was able to uh, to provide what, what at that time is what he needed. And, and at the end of the day, what's it like to save someone's life to know that you saved his life? Well, it's, I certainly can't take full credit. There were so many others involved um, that uh, that's, that's not a credit I'm, I'm uh, comfortable accepting all on my shoulders uh, because there were just too many other people involved um, with making the mission a, a success. So we all shared in a very uh, a big rejoicing on the ship, uh, knowing that, uh, that the Marines were able to make a difference that night. Uh, and, and helping an Air Force, uh, a fellow service member, uh, in his time of need. And uh, I'm just trying to think, I mean, when he got back on the ship, I mean, obviously, is he, is he doing well now? I don't know if you know, his injuries weren't life threatening, I guess? No, not at all. In fact, we've been in uh, contact since that time, periodically, through email. I have, I have not be able to, been able to sit down and uh, see him since, um, but uh, we've been in contact. And uh, he's, he's certainly humbled and he's always grateful. You know, he's, every time I talk to him or he sends out an email, every, every member of the team from the, the youngest Marine in the back of the Osprey to me as the Harrier pilot involved, he thanks all of us uh, for, for what we all were able to do that night.
And when you saw me, one of the last things you said to you was, you know, tell my wife goodbye. When you saw him, did that come back to your head that he wouldn't have to say goodbye? Uh, it certainly did. Uh, certainly one of those things that, uh, you know, being a family man myself, that I could understand his concern and that, uh, so the importance of that to him and, and, and importance to me of ensuring that uh, not on my watch was I gonna let that happen if, I, if there's any way possible I could affect it. Uh, and so it was certainly exciting and, and very um, just monumental for me to be able to, to say that I made, you know, I made a difference uh, in, in that event. And, and during the mission, obviously you have to be collected and focused on what you're doing, but is there any room to be nervous? No, uh, there really isn't. And uh, at that time, you, in a moment like that, you have to rely on your training. Uh, we spend hours and hours, um, as carrier pilots specifically, but uh, the, the trap package, you know, so for the, the Harriers, the Ospreys, the 53s that were involved, all of us had practiced at least two other times for this mission specifically, uh, so that when when called upon, we knew we could we could run uh, effectively and, and react quickly uh, to the given situation. Because it's really a, a pickup game, if you will, because you never know where uh, the aircraft or personnel are going to go down, what kind of environment it's going to be in, what uh, climate it's in. So you have to be re able to react to anything, and and you sort of you just rely on your training and uh, and hope that it, it comes through uh, at, at that moment. And kind of changing to a lighter subject, um, do you have anything to say to your hometown of Louisa? Uh, well, it's it's uh, um, you know, I, I, I miss Idaho dearly. Uh, you know, I've been away now for a little over 10 years and I consider myself uh, an Idahoan through and through. and. You know, my wife is from Idaho, and her family is still there. All my family is there. Uh, so, um, you know, nothing more than hi, and that uh, I hope, hope I made them proud. And, uh, and yeah, I can't wait to get back. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you made everyone proud. Uh, how long did you live in Weezer for? I grew up there, born and raised. So I um, was there until I was 18, and then I, I went to college at the College of Idaho. So I uh, was in the local area there, Treasure Valley, um, all the way until I, I went in the Marine Corps. So it's really the only the home I know. And Major, is there anything else that you want to make sure we, we add or that we have? Uh, no, uh, really, uh, thank you for the interest. Thank you for uh, the attention uh, on me. And, and hopefully I can be a, a, a good spokesman for all the great things that uh, not only happened that night, but that, that are going on daily around the world by Marines everywhere. Um, unfortunately, not all of them can, can receive the recognition um, that I am right now. And, and, and I appreciate your interest in, in uh, what the Marine Corps has, has done. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your service. We really appreciate everything that you've done. Oh, absolutely. It's an honor. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.